Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to the uh, panel and to the CBI committee for having me here today. Uh, I've been tasked with giving a lecture on the ABCs of wound care. Daunting task to do in eight minutes, but I'll try my best to get through it. Uh, hopefully give you a little glimpse as to what we're looking at in, the, in matters of wound care and how to best manage this patient population. These are my disclosures. So the facts, I think it's really important that we understand what we're dealing with here and that seconds do count in this patient population. Every 20 seconds a limb is lost secondary to complication of diabetes with more than 2,500 limbs lost per day, an astonishing number. Uh, those who have had an amputation do carry approximately a 70% risk of re-amputation over the next five years without changes and modifications in diet, lifestyle, and overall habits. 85% uh, of those diabetic foot related complications have been found to be preventable through a team approach and I think all of us here will uh, touch upon that in some way, shape or form, but it really is important that that team approach is so critical uh, not only in our institution but I think across uh, uh, our specialties <clears throat> to help manage the diabetic foot population. So I think in order to really understand a wound, you have to be able to classify a wound. And there's several different classifications out there to help manage these wounds. A well-designed classification schemes to do the following. Should provide a valuable means for organization. Should rec uh, represent a common language when speaking with other medical providers. Uh, assist with reimbursement and importantly, provide a validation for your chosen treatment. Various uh, classifications out there include the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory, the Wagner classification, which is most widely used in most hospital systems, University of Texas scheme, which has been adopted for the diabetic foot, and more commonly now, the Wi-Fi classification, which is a broader classification uh, currently being used in our institutions and I think many institutions that have limb salvage programs, which focuses on the wound, the ischemic component, and, as well as foot infection. It's a zero to three grading scale, and that number that you get helps to predict the amputation risk with a hope to standardize those outcomes. And there's some great articles that have been out there recently published by the SVS validating this. And in our current center, we're also working to validate this, uh, this uh, classification scheme. So we'll jump right into various types of wounds. I'll touch on some of the wounds that we most commonly see. Uh, not all wounds require revascularization. I think that's the important thing to understand because you do get a lot of patients that come to us having undergone multiple revascularization attempts when in actuality it's a mechanical problem that's not appropriately being addressed. So dry gangrene. Dry gangrene is a common thing that we see in our clinics. Patients refer to us all the time for it. Uh, it's not a medical emergency. This is a dry, stable wound that generally can undergo revascularization first uh, before any management can be done. We have patients that, for one reason or another, are not surgical candidates or not the most optimal, and they may have a gangrenous toe that's there for several months, if not longer. Uh, and we may allow that to auto-amputate. Uh, in some cases, however, procedures have to get done to manage that necrotic tissue. You do worry when you revascularize that that, that tissue can go from a dry gangrene to a wet gangrene. And once you have a wet gangrene, that's considered a medical emergency, and that has to be managed from the get-go. No uh, vascular or interventional cardiologist or radiologist is going to go and try and revascularize this kind of foot with this type of infection. So it's critical that we manage that infectious component first uh, in these situations, and those are considered a medical emergency. Decubitus or pressure ulcers, again, a very huge problem within our institutions. Uh, these things have to be understood as being a preventable problem. Um, if you see your patients, you make sure they have proper offloading, these things are preventable. Sadly, we see a lot of uh, the outside facilities, nursing facilities, long-term care facilities that don't necessarily focus on this because there's so much emphasis placed on managing other bodily wounds that this gets slighted. So efficient offloading is critical to in order uh, to prevent these types of problems. Uh, venous stasis ulcerations also affect close to uh, half a million people in the U.S. Uh, much different presentation than your ischemic type of lesions. Uh, usually present with this granular beefy base, can be painful, and a lot of times don't require surgical management. Good local wound care, compression therapy can help manage these wounds. And then your neuropathic ulcers. These are the wounds that most commonly don't require a revascularization. You know, if you do your thorough uh, vascular evaluation and realize that flow is there, generally these wounds are, are there because of poor management for foot gear, um, education, and bony prominences or other mechanisms that cause these problems. So when we look at wounds, there are three practical questions that we like to consider. When am I going to take off the wound to help heal it? 
What can I use to may enhance the healing, prevent infection, and how can I ultimately prevent recurrence? We'll talk about some various agents briefly. Uh, for debridement options, you have topical agents such as Santal, very well-known product as an enzymatic debridement agent. And there's a new class of agents currently out there now uh, called surfactants, highly concentrated surfactants, which act in a, as a washing mechanism for the wound. It's similar in an enzymatic debridement agent, but it's a, a different mechanism of action on how that works. Then you have your mechanical debridement agents. This is done by ultrasonic debridements and or uh, a tool called the VersaJet, which uses a high velocity flow to help debride a wound. It's non-selective, however, it does a great job at converting uh, a wound, as you see at the top there, to a healthy granular base that will hopefully accept a graft at some point and get that patient into a salvage. Various types of dressings available. There are hundreds of dressings available to us. Uh, I can't sit here and begin to go over all the lists. These are some of the various things that we use in the clinics. You have your basic dressing categories, your meta honeys, idosorbs, those things you can regularly order in most hospital systems. Dakin solution is a big friend of ours. We use a ton of Dakins for management of wounds. And then you have your advanced biological dressings, your um, uh, bilayer matrices with collagen, your amniotic products, and your A-cell, your dermal matrices that all help to either act as a scaffold and or bring those wounds to closures. And then, of course, negative pressure is a very important part of our practice and the things that we do. Negative pressure is out there to help bolster grafts, help promote and enhance uh, granulation tissue formation. Uh, so we use this a lot in our institution and we help it's a very, I find it's a very helpful part of our practice. And then preventing recurrence. Offloading is a really critical aspect. You can get offloading versus internal versus external offloading. External offloading would include various devices like these, offloading shoes, a total contact cast. And then you have your surgical offloading. Uh, this is a patient that has what's called equinus. And equinus is a uh, contraction to form of the Achilles tendon, which leads to enhanced forefoot pressures. So simple techniques that can be done in the OR under local anesthetic blocks, doing a uh, percutaneous stab incision to help lengthen that tendon, you get a few degrees of length and that can rapidly help reduce the forefoot pressures that get those forefoot ulcers healed. Then you have various neuropathic ulcers such as these that include ulcers at the interphalangeal joint, small procedures where you go in and resect a little part of the bone, help reduce that contracture, will rapidly get that wound to heal. Again, these are not, these are not vascular related wounds, these are neuropathic wounds. They develop these ulcers secondary to poor fitting shoes most likely. Then you have your mallet toes, <clears throat> again, ulcers at the distal tips of the phalanxes. Uh, simple procedure can be done in the clinic by a local block. Uh, nicking the flexor tendon and allowing some flexibility of the toe usually will rapidly enhance healing. And then uh, wounds such as these where you have contractions both at the interphalangeal joint as well as the metatarsophalangeal joint placing excessive pressures on both of those areas. And you could do releases to help ma uh, manage that and get those wounds to heal quickly. A surgical procedure such as a metatarsal head resection can help manage those and get those wounds healed quite rapidly. We have patients that may come into us having wounds for months and we'll do a quick procedure on them in the OR uh, and uh, those wounds will be healed within weeks. Some advances in wound care, there's a lot of great new dressings that are out there to help advance product, advance what we're doing. Silver-based products, hyaluronic, that acid-based products, and also fish skin products that help to uh, get wounds healed. And then you have various imaging modalities that are out there now. This is a hyperspectral imaging device which looks at oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin to help evaluate tissue perfusion and to determine if we can better manage these wounds. And lastly, we have the um, wearable technologies. This is a really uh, kind of on the forefront of wound healing, pressure sensing mats and socks that send alerts to your cell phone to let you know when there's a hot spot. Hot spots are found to be the initial phases of wound breakdown. So this kind of falls in a preventative medicine. And these are great things that are on the forefront of medicine and I think things that we should be looking into to help engage our patients to be involved in their care. And I think I did it. Thank you very much for your time.